Well, good morning, church family. Welcome to First Methodist Church Sweetwater, for this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us indeed rejoice and be glad in it. We are so thankful that you are here today. I'm going to ask now that if you have a Facebook account, if you would, grab your phone here during the prelude, open up that Facebook, and click a share button as the service is going to be streaming live. We want to make sure and get the word spread about our church and, more importantly, about Jesus Christ. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship. Water. My name is Kelsey, just in case you didn't know, and we are so very glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. Um, please fill out the attendance pad that is in your pew, and if you would like any other information about the church or would like to get more involved in the church, you can fill out the next step card that's found in the pew pocket thing. Um, with the pew pocket thing is an offering envelope just in case. You will drop both of those things off in the offering basket during communion. Um, next, I would like to talk to you about some events that are coming up. Next week, the 8th through the 12th, the high school kids are going to be going to camp. Please join us in prayer while they're uh, at camp this week. Um, they're going to be learning about um, how to be deeply rooted in their faith and how to worship with purpose and how to grow deeper with God through that time. So if you'll please join us in prayer, um, that would be awesome. Additionally, we have a volunteer opportunity because um, we still need uh, volunteers for shop, which is uh, July 15th through the 19th. Um, if you have any questions or you'd like to get involved with that, please get with Dee Dee. Um, there's some background check stuff that you'll have to do but we got that covered for you um and safety is important so it's a good step that we're going to do that um like i said i'm so very glad that you're here um and this is just a beautiful day that the lord has made and it's just awesome so now i believe the mission statement is going to play after me so
I love it. That was wonderful, Kelsey. Thank you. Let me invite y'all to stand and join me in our call to worship. You could find this on the screen there. Uh, let's go. That's the mission statement. We can say that together, though. To make disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. And now let's go to our call to worship. Come, listen to the word of the Lord. Proclaim the goodness of God's love. Come, now is the time to worship. Amen. Amen. Let's now continue in a time of worship. If you'll remain standing and join me in singing our opening hymn, To God Be the Glory, on page 98 of the hymnal. To God be the glory things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing to Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. And so, Lord, we do seek to praise you, praise you, so that all the world may know of the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice continually, Father. Let us continue to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And when one is maybe struggling with finding that joy, help us to gently nudge and encourage one another to see the positive, the good in life, to reflect upon the fact that we can proclaim we are children of God through the name of Jesus. Father, we lift before you this morning Cornerstone Fellowship Church. We just pray blessings over their service, over their leadership, Lord, over the person who brings the message there. Would you just anoint their time of worship? May it be something that is pleasing and honoring to you. May it point people to the good news of Jesus. May they continue to be a light for you in this community. And Father, we pray the same for ourselves here at First Methodist Church Sweetwater, that we would truly, truly point people to the good news of Jesus Christ, that we would continue to shine your light, Lord, that we would be the light as Ken spoke last Sunday. Father, that we would recognize that we are called to have that song on our hearts and on our minds and coming from our, our voices. Every moment, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And so, Father, as we continue this time of worship, help us to sing as though we truly are your people. Help us to sing in such a way that we're not concerned about anything around us. We're not concerned about whether our voice is, is in tone or not. We're more concerned about singing praises to you because you are a God who is worthy. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray, and we thank you for your presence through the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let us continue to stand and worship. Lord, 
I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, without you, I fall apart, you're the Release your heavy burdens 
and let everything that has breath praise the Lord. This is why we have breath. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you're in the desert. Sometimes you feel the pain. Sometimes he calms the storm. And sometimes he lets it rain. But please don't hold your breath and just breathe. Cause it's a miracle we can breathe. There's power in the way that we breathe. Release your heavy burden. Feel the strength coming back again. I'm breathing, I'm breathing in oxygen. I can feel my lungs taking air again. can feel my strength coming back again. I'm breathing, breathing in oxygen. I can feel my heart, there it goes again. I'm going to invite you to just close your eyes where you are for a second, or you can just look down and just let's take in a deep breath this morning. Take it in and then let it out. Do that two more times with me if you would. For there truly is power in the breath of life that we breathe. And certainly we can't help but sing praises to God as we breathe out, as we exhale and we find that rest that comes over our body, we find that because of the name of Jesus. No matter our circumstance, what's going on, 
I pray that that would be the case, that we could take a step back, we could take in a few deep breaths and just simply praise the Lord and find the gift that's given to us through just breathing and reflecting upon the good news of Jesus Christ. And so God, give us the strength to do so in moments where we feel overwhelmed to take a step back and just breathe and reflect upon your goodness and who we are as your children. We love you and we praise you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to invite our laity reader to come forward this morning. I was trying to see if he's here, and I don't know if he is, so I'm about to call on someone to come up and read our scripture this morning and pray for us. And so I'm going to invite Zolly, if he will, come up. You knew it was coming, Zolly. You knew it was coming, but if you'd read our scripture for us this morning, and then the prayer's on the back side of that page there. Thank you, brother. Our scripture is found in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, titled, Do Not Love the World. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world, for all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride in riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires are passing away. But those who do, who do the will of God abide forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Loving God, we are yours. We come as we are with our cares and our concerns. We long to touch you and to find healing in your embrace. Strengthen our faith and heal our brokenness that we may worship you with joy. Please be with Tyler as he brings the message today. Speak powerfully through him. It's in Christ's name we all pray. Amen.
death is just a memory and tears are no more. We'll enter in as the wedding bells ring. Your bride will come together and we'll see your beauty. Well, it's good to be back. I've had several people ask me how, uh, I don't know if you want to applaud that or not. Um, I've had several people ask me, they're like, so how was vacation? And I'm like, I kind of need a vacation for my vacation, to be honest with you. Um, being out at the beach, and, and so we were in Orange Beach, Alabama. We had the chance to, to go back out that direction. We've done this the last, I guess, five years, something like that. Uh, but having the chance to go again, it was wonderful. It's a lot longer drive, I will tell you that. We drove all the way back on Friday without stopping um, and spending the night somewhere. So it was a long, long day. I think 18 hours, 17 hours total on the road, something like that, between our, our stops and everything. Um, but, it, but it was a good trip, you know, and, and I love going out to Orange Beach. I will tell you, I'm more of a mountain guy. I prefer the mountains. Anybody else more of a mountain person over a beach person? That's just, just me, and, and maybe that's because you can only experience so much sand and so much salt water before you're like, I'm done. I'm done. Like, sand gets in, it's just uncomfortable. Let's just be honest about the sand, okay? Um, but, but there are parts of being at Orange Beach and being there at the, at the ocean I really do enjoy. One of my favorite things that I've had the opportunity to do uh, in, in the last few years is that we either kayak or we paddleboard. We get into a bayou, cotton bayou there, and we, we go... Uh, last year I started paddle boarding, which is kind of like a big flat surfboard, and they give you this paddle, and you stand on it, and you just paddle yourself. And it's really exciting to go out in the bay, and then you get to these islands. They have Crab Island, which has hermit crabs, and you have Robinson Island, and then you have Bird Island, which has birds, and this amazing beach on, on Bird Island where you can kind of go out in the, in the water, and, and it's real shallow, real clear. It's really a neat experience. And so last year was my first time paddle boarding to that area. And I will tell you, if the wind's blowing on a paddle board, it's exhausting, right? You figure out really quick that if I'm standing, I'm like a cell, and the wind's blowing me. And if it's going against me, it's pushing me this way. And you're like paddling, like, where am I going? And so you have to drop down on your knees and paddle. Um, but it's a really neat experience. And what I love about the paddle board versus the kayak is that it, it brings you closer to the water. You feel more like one with the water. But last year I discovered that sometimes that's a terrifying feeling when you're one with the water going over a whole bunch of jellyfish and like really big jellyfish and boats are slowly going by you. They're not supposed to leave awake, but they think it's funny to leave awake. And they warned me about this and you're on this paddleboard trying to not fall in the water, rocking and watching these creepy looking jellyfish. And I've never been stung by jellyfish and and I probably shouldn't say that because if I go back, I'm sure I will now get stung by jellyfish. But I've been fortunate, I've never been stung by jellyfish. But I just have to tell you, those are one of the most weird sea creatures ever. 
Like, what on earth is the purpose of a jellyfish? And I'm, I know there's, someone's got the answer out there, right? But they're just bizarre looking. And, and it's funny to me because this year, paddle boarding, I, I, I actually just went with Taylor this year. And I thought it would be fun for Taylor to sit on the front of the paddle board. I've seen parents do this. And for just her and I to have this experience where I'm paddle, bo- paddle boarding out on the water. And of course, Taylor is a little bit nervous about what sea creatures are underneath this board. What could happen What could we fall and hit? And I'm like, well, I haven't seen any jellyfish this year, so I think we're good. And I'm trying to encourage her, don't be afraid, baby. Don't be afraid. I know we don't know what's here, but don't be afraid. It's going to be good. But all along on the inside, I'm terrified because what creepy crawly thing is like underneath this board? And there was a moment this year with Taylor on the board, and this is surprising, where I fell off of it, and I knocked her off, I think, at least once. And I think I fell off another two times. And as a grown man... If you had seen how terrified I was to get back on that board as quickly as possible, it it was a pretty comical moment. But that's because, again, there's a lot of just weird stuff in the water. And I have a point why I'm sharing that with you. But it was a great vacation. We're so thrilled to be back. Um, We had a chance to go to the aquarium while we were there on Dauphin Island and and get to see uh, some more of those creepy. You ever seen a horseshoe crab in person? Those are really bizarre little creatures, just for the record. There's, again, all sorts of weird sea creatures. But today we're going to be in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. It's a short reading, and we're looking here where Paul is addressing the churches in Rome. We've, we've studied this text. I'm looking forward to it in the fall. We're going to go through the book of Romans, and so I'm looking forward to that. But I thought we'd kind of dive into this today as we continue our series on how to be a perfect Christian. Again, this is satire. Um, and Paul here is navigating with the church in Rome there, the need for them to be set apart, to be different. And so hear what he says here in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, on the basis of God's mercy, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, would you open up our hearts and our minds and our ears to receive your truth? Father, would you anoint the words that come from my mouth? Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence with us now, that you are moving within us, stirring us to live a life that is truly sanctified, that is truly set apart, that we might truly be different for this world, because this world needs to see Christ in and through us. So again, free us from distraction. Help us to be present right here in this moment. Amen. And so we've been looking at some silly quotes, and again, this is satire, so this is not intended to be truthful. This is intended to make you laugh. Hopefully it makes you laugh. If not, that's okay. We'll, we'll go with it. You're laughing on the inside, just you're not externally laughing with me. I love this first one. Here's a fun quote. Doctrine. Uh, Doctrine, what is that? Is that some kind of a Pokemon? Here's another one. The Bible is inerrant, which means without error, unless it contradicts any preconceived cultural or emotional viewpoints you bring to the text. This is called eisegesis, so learn to use that as often as you can. Make the text be what you want for it to be. Obviously, satire. Don't do that. Here we go. Key evidence of salvation is as follows. You have to be impeccably dressed on Sunday morning. You're all doing a fantastic job. You have to have 30 years of perfect attendance at church. Anyone there? You have to have a collected works of C.S. Lewis. The collected works, excuse me, of C.S. Lewis. You have to have a Christian fish emblem on your car. And you have to have the ability to find any book of the Bible in 3.2 seconds without using the table of contents. And you have to have proof of visiting the Holy Land at least once. This is the cultural norm, after all. And then the one I want you to hear again, it's satire, but it's, it's amazing how much this resonates as truth for some believers. If Christian culture shifts its beliefs, you must be ready to immediately accept any new doctrine that hits the mainstream. And so summing all these satirical quotes up, in other words, allow the culture and your feelings to dictate truth for the church and for you. Disregard scriptural truths and truths accepted by the church for thousands of years and instead make truth what you want for it to be. 
And that sounds absolutely ridiculous, does it not? However, it's not too far-fetched, is it? We can look at churches in our nation and we can look at churches around the world and see that a lot have actually disregarded what has been truth for thousands of years and instead decided to take up what they believe is truth based off of their feelings or what is the mainstream thing. What we see is that the lines are truly blurring. So I read from Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 and I think whenever you look at this text you would have saw the therefore in the text, right? And anytime you see therefore you have to ask, well what is it therefore? And so if you look back over the previous chapter, what you're going to see is Paul is talking to the churches and to the church in Rome, and he's dealing with churches that have become predominantly Gentile due to the fact that the Jews have been ran out of Rome not too long before this text. And they're slowly, they're making their way back in, the Jewish folks are, into the church. And what we know is that many of the Jewish people had rejected the gospel altogether, but there was most definitely tension among the Jews as they returned to Rome and into the churches where they had lost influence with their, absence, with their absence. And so imagine again these churches that were Jewish and Gentile, and then all of a sudden the Jews are ran out, and they're coming back, and the Gentiles have been leading and running things, and the Jews are trying to come and be a part again. But now it's like we've kind of lost our influence and our sway. It's more what the Gentiles would have us do, which where did the Gentiles come from? They had a Roman background, a pagan-style worship background. So obviously there would have been tensions taking place between these two groups of folks. But Paul's message here to the church in Rome is he's calling for them to be different than what they see in their culture to be different than what you see in Rome. Don't be arrogant. Don't be selfish. Don't be just focused on yourself, but be loving and kind and welcoming to one another. Don't give in to your former ways of worshiping through the law and your legalism, nor through worshiping of yourself and paganism, but find Christ right there in the middle. But certainly Paul has this message for him of of not being arrogant and selfish, but being in unity together, loving one another. And verses 3 and 5 of Romans chapter 12 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another." Love and respect and encourage one another. Be there for one another. Don't live into the extremes. Don't live for self, but live for Christ. And certainly you have to see that the Gentiles in this church in Rome, they were going to be fighting. I think they would have been fighting the cultural leanings of being unloving to their Jewish brothers and sisters as they came back into Rome. And again... I think you can see if you go and you look at Romans chapter 1, Paul is encouraging to fight against the culture, the leanings to worship creation instead of the creator. And certainly you would have seen this in Rome where they were worshiping again creation rather than the creator. And it says this in Romans chapter 1. And what they were doing because of that is they were suppressing the truth and exchanging it for a lie. And again, why is that? Because they were worshiping creation rather than the Creator. They are worshiping themselves and their desires and their feelings and their needs rather than the Creator. So Paul is challenging, do not be conformed by this world. Do not be conformed by what you see around you, the mainstream cultural norms. Don't be transformed by that or conformed by that, but rather be transformed in the renewing of your mind. Know what the true will of God is for your life, what he desires from you, not what those around you desire, but what God alone desires for you. I think certainly if we look at the modern day church, especially in America, I I would imagine you can agree with me that we've allowed the culture to dictate too much of how we ought to behave and what we ought to believe. Y'all agree with me on that? Not here at First Methodist Church Sweetwater, of course. I'm talking about other churches. But we've allowed the culture to dictate. In so many ways, I would say that the church 
has exchanged the truth for a lie and begun to worship creation instead of the creator. Conforming. And when I say the church, I know I'm generalizing. I'm not saying our church, and so please don't take it like I'm, well, Tyler doesn't think that we, I'm not saying that about our church, but I'm saying the church in a whole has become so focused on pleasing people and pleasing the culture and fitting in with what's normative in this culture that it's exchanging truth for lies. And that is, in essence, brothers and sisters, worshiping creation rather than the creator. I wrote a quote down about four or five years ago, and I'll stand by it, that when we, when we become more focused on pleasing man, we will fail to please God. Amen? When we become more focused on pleasing man, we will fail to please God. We're called to worship our creator, not creation. How is this evident? It's evident to me because you look at how we treat others and how we treat ourselves. Look at how we handle sin and those who struggle with sin. I think sometimes we like to tra- uh, claim that it's true love for others, but in reality it's love of ourselves and fear of being unloved. And so what do I mean by that? Sometimes we are afraid to confront things and speak truth into people's lives, and we say that the reason why we do that is because we love them. Because I love them and I don't want to offend them. But in reality, who are we more concerned about? Are we concerned about them or concerned about ourselves? I would hate for them to not love me because I said something that, you know, is not in agreement with them. I'd hate to offend them. But that's about me, not about them. Can we all agree if you truly love someone, you're going to speak truth to them? As a parent, I guarantee you I'm going to speak truth to my kids no matter how they respond to me. Why? Because I love them too much to speak opposite. They need to hear truth. So again, I think we see a blurring in lines even in our church. It's getting extremely blurry. It's hard to distinguish the church believers in America from the secular world. And really, if you think about it, it's easier for us to know someone's favorite sport team or political view than to know their doctrine and what they believe. And I think there's also a crazy division in selfishness, selfishness, selfishness excuse me, in the church rather than unity found in Jesus. You know, it matters for us to worship our creator rather than creation. It matters for us to be firm in what it is we believe. It matters for us not to, to cater in to mainstream doctrine but stand firm in Scripture that's been there for 2,000 years. And in fact, we should, we should, and we might be able to pull up the Apostles' Creed and read that together today, because I think it's important that we stand firm in that, right? I think it's important that we look different from our culture, because what will unbelievers be drawn to if they don't see anything different from within the church walls? We'd just be a social club, not a church. So my challenge for us today is this. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And what was the message that Ken preached last Sunday? We're called to be the light, to have nothing to do with darkness. And it goes on and says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. If you go back and you start reading about the Israelites leaving Egypt, and you see the moments where God gets angry with the Israelites, the reason why he gets angry is because of this, because they kept going back to their former ways of who they were when they were held captive in Egypt. And they kept forgetting that they were his people. And we too have been grafted into, we've been grafted into God's people. We are his, and we should look different. We should be different. It 
some things to consider. We, we need to think of ourselves with sober judgment, don't we? With humility. We need to remember who we are and our call. And again, it's only going to take place when we remember that we're called to worship the Creator instead of creation. And that does include us worshiping ourselves or ideals rather than worshiping God alone. And it does include not going along with the cultural movement if it seems opposite of what God's calling us to. We must be different. But the prayer is that the main difference that people will see you in you is that you live for Christ, that we live for Christ instead of for ourselves. That again, we worship our Creator, not creation. So one of the creepiest, weirdest creatures I've seen, uh, my daughter Anna, there's, there's actually, I guess, a lot. The blobfish is kind of weird in the ocean. But one of the weirdest ones I've, I've seen that she shared with me was what's called a mimic octopus. Have you all ever seen this thing? A mimic octopus. And this thing will take, and, and Anna's smiling really big, because she had a, I think you had a project on it, didn't you, or something? Okay, a, a, okay, slide presentation. Yeah, this mimic octopus, and I don't remember all the things it mimics. I know it can mimic like a lionfish, an ill, what else, Anna? You, you got all this in your brain. Okay, a bunch of other things. But it mimics a bunch of other things, and the reason why it does this is, is to keep from getting eaten, which makes sense, right? And then also whenever it wants to eat something, all right? So predator and prey response. It mimics, and so they, they recently, this is a very, like, within the last 20 years discovery, I think, um, it's, it's not been around as far as in our, our books for a long time, but this mimic octopus, and again, it's all about self-preservation. It's about itself. It's a very selfish way of living, right? My question for us is, how many of us are living our lives as believers like the mimic octopus? That it's this self-preservation, that it's about me and about, again, not offending somebody, but it's really about me not, not making someone mad at me. So I'm not going to speak truth in this. Or I'm just going to go along, I'm not going to speak against this because I don't want to offend anybody. And, uh, and, and you know God's telling you to speak. Or maybe you started to exchange some truths for lies in your life. And, and I can't tell you what that is. I have my own areas where I believe that God is constantly moving me forward and revealing to me areas where, e, you know, I thought I was living in truth on that when I told Dee Dee this, but e, I think I exchanged that truth for a lie. It wasn't truth. Have you ever had that in a, a moment of discussion with your spouse? Never, right? Where you realize that you were in the wrong. But I just want to challenge you as a church family to consider where have you been conforming? Where have you been conforming? And your call is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that's a daily process, to remember who you are as a child of God. Let that dictate how you carry yourself, and what you believe. Don't let the world, don't let the feelings that you have, don't let that dictate, but let God, that we might worship our creator rather than creation. So Father God, we thank you so much for the gift of life that we have through Christ Jesus. We thank you for your grace that even where we fall short, even in moments where we do conform, you offer to us that grace that we might learn. Would you reveal to us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, this week, in the next month, year, would you reveal to us where it is maybe we've been conforming to this world rather than being transformed? Would you help us as your church to truly be the body of Christ? to truly go out and proclaim the good news of Jesus? Would we be people who are truly selfless? Would we be people who truly worship you and not creation? Stir our hearts. Reveal to us again where it is you're trying to transform us because we're continuing to want to conform. 
It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And so it was on the night in which Jesus was betrayed that he took bread, he gave thanks to you, O Lord, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, when the supper was over, he took the cup, he lifted up, he gave thanks to you, O Lord, he blessed it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many. Do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we ask that you would truly make this be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we might be the body of Christ for this world, that we might proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you unite us as your people? Would you reveal to us again where it is that you are wanting to continue to transform and work in our lives where maybe we have conformed, where maybe we have sought to worship creation instead of you, where we maybe sought to worship our feelings instead of your call, and your truth. Would you bless this time of Holy Communion? Forgive us again where we fall short. And we thank you for your presence within us through the Holy Spirit to stir us towards truth. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. I want to invite our communion stewards, if you will, come forward at this time. And as they come forward, I want to remind you again that this is an open communion table. All are welcome here. For this is actually a time where you get to come and be renewed in that transformation. To be reminded of who you are as a child of God. To be reminded of your call to worship the Creator and not creation. As always, as you come forward, you can place your offering envelopes in the basket here in the middle or your next step cards. The rail is open for you to kneel and pray. If you need for me to pray over you, I am serving gluten-free communion uh, uh, elements here in the middle for you. Um, Just get my attention. I'll do the best I can to get over to you. Uh, I'm waiting for a Sunday for that to happen because I know it'll be kind of juggling, but please don't hesitate if you need prayer or if you need prayer after service, don't hesitate. If you need to know more about Jesus, what it means to be a follower of Christ, to truly be transformed, find me after service. Let's talk today about what it means to be a child of God. Brothers and sisters, the table is now open. I invite you to come.
Is there anyone who needs to be served where they're seated? So, Lord, we thank you for this gift of Holy Communion. We thank you that we can come together as your people, truly transform the news of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be mindful of the attacks of the enemy, the one who seeks to conform us to the patterns of this world. Help us again to flee from that, to worship you alone, We thank you for this gift again of Holy Communion and the reminder of who we are as your people. Amen. If you'll please stand and join in the closing hymn this morning, singing Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, found on page 349 of the hymnal. What a beautiful acolyte this morning. And so tan, and she's got beach shells for her necklace and for earrings. Looking awesome. So uh, just a reminder real quick that we probably do still need some more volunteers for the shop. So if you'd find my wife after this, I'd really appreciate it if you can help. You can help one day, two days, the whole week, but we do need help uh, next week with that. And please be praying for our students who are off at church camp this week. We'll try to get a list of names sent out to you by email or Facebook. And now go forward as God's people, knowing who you are and standing firm in his truth. Go forward seeking to worship the creator. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday.